Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. If you would like to make sure that I can keep bringing you more content like this, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. Welcome to Japan Station. I'm your host, Tony Vega. Just a couple quick thank yous here at the top of the show, and then we'll get into the、uh, main part of the show. But first of all, thank you so much to Ashley T.、Uh, Ashley sent me a very, very nice email over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. She was just very positive about the show,、uh, gave me some very, very nice feedback. So thank you, Ashley. That was just a, a wonderful surprise in my inbox. I mean, a lot of times I'm just getting like random press releases, or even worse, like, Scam spam emails. So <laughs> it's always nice to have, you know, some nice words thrown at you.、Um, and I'm not begging for complimentary emails here. I just want to say thank you because it's a very nice thing that、uh, Ashley took the time to do. She absolutely had no obligation to do so, and yet she enjoyed the show enough to do that. So thank you, Ashley.、Um, another person that I want to say thank you to is,、um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but it's、uh, CVLTVRE. Cavaltry, <laughs> so Cavaltry.、Um, I'm just going to go with Cavaltry here. But <laughs> this individual left me a very nice、uh, review over on Apple Podcasts, and uh, that was uh, really, really appreciated. It's always nice to get a, a review over there because that kind of stuff. Could influence somebody into checking out the show, and it was a very positive、uh, review, so that's extra appreciated.、Um, so, if you haven't done so yet, go ahead and do that. And if you haven't subscribed to the show on your podcast app,、um, I think actually. Apple Podcast is making a switch to the way they do things. So I think I'm supposed to say follow for Apple Podcasts now、uh, because subscribe has turned into something else. But whatever the case, you know, follow the show on your podcast app because that typically does boost the rankings for the show. And that means that more people find the show. And that means that even if you can't support the show on Patreon, maybe one of those new people might. And hey, that helps me out a lot. So <laughs> if you can't spend any money but you want to support the show, go ahead and do that.、Uh, But again, thank you so much to Kavaltry and、uh, Ashley. I really, really do appreciate you taking the time to、uh, send me some nice words and write a review. All right, so my guest today is Dr. Jan Bardsley. She is Professor Emerita of Asian Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Her area of expertise is basically Japanese women's studies with a focus on、uh, portrayals of women in media. And her latest book, which just came out in March of 2021, so it's just Hot off the presses. It's called Michael Masquerade Crafting Geisha Girlhood in Japan.、Uh, I got to read an advanced copy. I discovered it and I reached out and I said, Hey, can I check this book out? It seems really interesting. And I managed to get an advanced copy. And、uh, yeah, so I, I read it, enjoyed it. I, I do recommend it. So basically, in a nutshell, I'm not going to go into all the you know, details of this book because we're going to talk about it. So I don't want to repeat myself. But、um, as you can probably、uh, figure out from the Title It's about geisha and Michael. So,、uh, Michael are apprentices of geisha. That is the simple, short, what is it? Michael are apprentices of geisha. That's like the five word explanation. <laughs> so,、um, but and by the way, geisha, geiko, we're, we're going to use those terms、uh, interchangeably. But of course, those are the female entertainers that you typically associate with、uh, Kyoto tea house districts and they play musical instruments and entertain usually male patrons.、Um, so, we are going to talk about that. Um, and again, Michael are the apprentices. So,、um, this book mainly focuses on Michael, but you can't talk about Michael without talking about Geisha as well. And what Dr. Bardsley did is she looked at media portrayals of Michael and Geisha, and、uh, she used autobiographies of you know, former Michael,、uh, former Geisha. You know, they wrote about their lives.、Um, and there's some really, really interesting stuff in there,、um, a lot of stuff that I had no idea about. So,、um, we, we're going to talk about all this and some fun stuff and some interesting history there. Uh, but uh, if you want to check out the book, then、uh, why not use the Amazon affiliate link for japankyo.com? That will support the show. So, japankyo.com slash Amazon. It won't cost you anything extra and、uh, it'll send a few pennies my way so that I can keep doing this and 
if you're listening to this, I guess you enjoy it. So hey, why not do that? <laughs> um, anything else you buy using that link will also uh, support the show. But um, anyway, let's get to it. Here is my conversation with Dr. Jan Bardsley. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. So, uh, let's start with the very basic question that I think, you know, will we'll basically set up everything. But, um, for example, like, I, I studied abroad in Osaka, which meant that I got to visit Kyoto a lot. Mm. And I would hear um, foreigners, for example, say, like, oh, look, it's a geisha. And then their <laughs> Japanese friend next to them was like, no, actually, that's a Michael. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, yeah. Or it's just a girl in a kimono. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, could you uh, explain for us what is a Michael and what's different from from a geiko or a geisha, um, sure. just kind of set that up for us. That's a good way to start. So mm -hmm. let's start first with the maiko or mm -hmm. apprentice geisha. Mm -hmm. So girls start this apprenticeship by finding an okia or geisha house that agrees to train them. And they mm -hmm. live at the okia under the supervision of its mother or okasan. And their apprenticeship may last five to six years. And during the apprenticeship, living at the okia... They have, they don't pay for any of their expenses. They don't earn any income except spending money, but their lodging, their meals, their arts lesson, and of course their gorgeous kimono are all provided by the okia. So as part of their training, Maiko work alongside geisha who often lead them in performing at, well, big public events in Kyoto and evening tea house parties. And Maiko spend their days studying traditional Japanese dance, music, and etiquette. But they're probably most famous, and this is where people really would recognize a, a Maiko. Mm -hmm. They're most famous for this elaborate hairstyle that you've mm -hmm. probably seen. Yeah. And they tend to wear, especially if they're dressed formally, wear a lot of bright hair ornaments. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just considered very pretty. And the rest of their outfit is also very eye-catching. You know, they have a bright kimono, a very long obi, and these high wooden sandals. Mm -hmm. And when they're dressed formally, they wear a kind of theatrical makeup. So they're quite mm. dazzling figures when they're in full mm. costume. So, like, visually, then, how do they uh, differ from a geiko? Can, can you you know, uh, easily distinct. I guess you can because the Japanese people always say, no, that's a, that's a Michael. They, right, they can tell right away. <laughs> exactly. So after her apprenticeship in five uh -huh. or six years, when she's around 20, a Michael uh -huh. may decide to become a geisha, a geiko, as uh -huh. they're known in Kyoto. And uh -huh. then this starts what can be a lifetime career. At uh -huh. this point, or shortly after um, she becomes a geiko. She might still mm -hmm. live in the Okia for a while, but then she eventually moves out on her own. She's really in control of her artistic life. She books her own schedules. She manages her mm -hmm. income, and she continues to study the arts, and she practices mm -hmm. very hard for the spring and fall dance productions. She mm -hmm. also has to uh, remain popular with the uh, clientele that like to be come that come to tea houses that are regular mm -hmm. patrons of tea houses, uh, so that she's frequently booked, um, and she will always remain affiliated with that original okia. And mm -hmm. being a geiko can be a lifetime profession. So, I remember seeing in Kyoto women performing that were in their eighties, and they were mm -hmm. geiko. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, and there's also a hairstyle switch. You know, Michael oh. had this elaborate hair that lasts, once it's set, lasts about seven to ten days, and they have to uh -huh. sleep on a kind of elevated pillow to protect uh, it. Okay, and they okay. get it redone, well, about every ten days. But mm -hmm. once they become a geiko, these days they use a wig instead mm -hmm. of having their own hair in these very elaborate old hairstyles so mm -hmm. when you're a gay coat you can sleep just fine you, <laughs> you can have a moderate you know more contemporary hairstyle but when you're dressed formally for dance then you would put on a wig 
Gotcha. Okay. And I guess the the kimono are also a little more subdued. It's like the I I guess the Michael have the um the long sleeve like the hoodie sode. Oh style right. As well. Good point. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They ha- as since Michael are girls, then they have mm-hmm. this very long sleeve, which signifies the maiden. But mm-hmm. the uh, the Maiko, uh, the Geiko tends to dress in a very subdued way, mm-hmm. a more adult fashion. She doesn't mm-hmm. have all the um, colorful hair ornaments or the high right. wooden sandals. She has much more kind of comfortable wear. Mm-hmm. Um, an, an interesting little anecdote that you mentioned in the book was this one mention of a as as you said, once uh, they make the transition from Michael to Geiko, they begin um, keeping track of their own finances yeah. and, and all their own. They move out. They're living on their own. And yeah. this is, for many of them, the first time that they've ever, I mean, pretty much for everyone, I guess you would say, this is the first time that they have to do anything like this. And so one uh, person that you mentioned, she was in the taxi and she didn't even know how to pay for the taxi. <laughs> right. And I could kind of imagine, you know, it's like you if you're, from 15 to 20, living this, in yeah. this Okia, in these small neighborhoods, and everything's taken care of, and probably a lot of the taxi drivers even know you, yeah. it must be completely different to suddenly be on your own. But I think yeah. even um, in the contemporary U.S., a lot of uh, a lot of my students going to college <laughs> were sort of for the first time having yeah. to kind of take care of themselves in new ways yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that, that uh, they just sort of taken for granted had always been done. Mm. And, and Iwasaki Mineko, the, um, the geiko that was um, what kind of the model for um, Arthur Golden's Memoirs of a Geisha, and then she wrote her mm. own book, Geisha Life. But she was so naive that when she moved into her own apartment, she didn't know how to boil water. She couldn't understand why the rice just didn't sort of pop out of the rice cooker. And then, when, of course, she realizes how to do this. But, yeah. but then she feels like, gee, this is so much work. I really love dancing. I love all the other parts of the Geiko profession. I'm going back to the Okia and forget all of this um, wow. taking care of, of a house. And I think if I can say, too, there, that sometimes in dramas, like there's an NHK TV show in 2008-9 called Dun Dun that's all about life in the Gion. Um, Uh And uh, and there's this one geisha mother who decides that she really wants to kind of bond with a long-lost daughter by making breakfast for her. Uh And the geisha house manager comes and says to her, oh! you're making breakfast? What about your hands? What will clients think if you get red hands? You know, we could hire a maid. Another maid would be fine. And she goes, that's okay. I'll use cream. It'll be fine. And Uh she goes, okay. And I thought probably for so many women in Japan watching that segment, they thought, hey, someone hire me a maid. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, wouldn't that be great if you're doing some chores and somebody says, Oh gosh, why don't we hire a maid to take care of that? <laughs> yeah, it's such a completely different world. I mean, in, in a way, it it reminded me of of um, what I know about the sumo world too. Oh uh, yeah, where it's just so isolated. Mm-hmm. They're in their own world doing things their own way you know when you're an apprentice you basically make little to no money and you really have to wait quite a while before you make your own money and you're independent you're even able to leave the stable which is you know where they live and live on your own so i I mean traditional sort of apprenticeship sort of way of lifestyle but uh just i couldn't help but think about that as i was oh sure that's it's really good comparison because they Mm -hmm. also go through this apprenticeship they're Mm -hmm. also the sumo wrestlers held up as a kind of symbol of Japan that's not, you know, in other places. Um, And so when people were telling me, you know, kept making these comparisons, and it's such a good one. So I watched all these videos on sumo, and I thought, oh, it it looks tougher. Oh, that looks like a hard (laughs) apprenticeship. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, of course, physically and psychologically demanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, th- that, that brings me to another question that I wanted to ask you is like, how, who did it, I guess it's really tough to say, and you know, it's, it's impossible to generalize, but can you say anything about 
who ends up becoming, uh, who chooses to become a Michael? Because I can only imagine that, again, much like Sumo, the numbers are shrinking Mm -hmm. and um, there's so much more competition. Like, yeah, you might like to sing and dance and play musical instruments and entertain people, but you could become an idol. You could become a singer. You could become an actress. You could become a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. There's so many other options now that are not as demanding as that. So can you say anything about who ends up doing this sort of thing? Yeah, you know, that's such a great question because it's Mm -hmm. a really tough kind of training. And Mm -hmm. I I mean, even thinking when I started grad school that it would take Mm -hmm. five to six years, I thought, boy, Mm -hmm. that's a long time. And here are these you know, people that are 15 years old thinking they're going to commit to an apprenticeship that might go that long. Um, So the, for my book, for my research, what I did Mm -hmm. was I read all kinds of literature about Michael and Geisha and also Mm -hmm. literature interviews about how they represented themselves. So I wasn't Mm -hmm. um, actually interviewing Michael and Geiko, but rather I was looking at their representation in Japanese popular culture, how other Mm -hmm. people would understand them. So when it comes to motivation, I'm Mm -hmm. thinking about the memoirs that I read by women in the profession. And most of them said they loved Japanese dance or they loved Mm -hmm. kimono or both. And Mm -hmm. some though just fell in love with the idea of becoming a Maiko on their high school field trips to Kyoto. Right, right, right. And because there's this kind of aura of a Maiko um, mm-hmm. that doesn't that that doesn't really square with how tough the training is, mm-hmm. um, a lot of girls leave after just a couple weeks. So mm-hmm. to prevent this kind of thing, now some Okia have started kind of trial, almost like the homestay, you know, mm-hmm. where come stay at the Okia for two weeks, see how life works here. Um, mm. So you get a taste. So women, young women, get a taste of it before they make a huge commitment, or before the okia mm-hmm. invests in them. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But but the um, so they come for different reasons. But what's interesting in the literature, I think, on all of this that's mm-hmm. written in the two thousands, is very little is said about the girls generally coming into this vocation, except that they come from all over Japan. They might come from Akita and Mm -hmm. uh, Okayama, all kinds, you know, all places around Japan. Then they come to Kyoto. And I get the strong sense in the literature that they're regarded as just girls from elsewhere. So it really Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what kind of background or whether that's class or education or social abilities, as long mm-hmm. the the critical thing is, can they become a Kyoto Maiko? Can they fit in with the hierarchy? Can they learn the special language mm-hmm. of the Hanamachi, the Geisha neighborhoods? Mm-hmm. Can they uh, devote themselves to the arts? And can they really learn to be this very um, what I call the Maiko like Maiko? So mm-hmm. we don't really learn much about the girls that come in. We learn mm-hmm. about the process of making them Maiko. And interestingly. We don't learn much about them after they leave, you know, because mm-hmm. most Maiko do not become Geiko. Mm-hmm. And uh, what happens afterwards, whether this, some, some have heard, you know, go back to school or they work in the um, service industry because after all, they've learned so much about kind of mm-hmm. hospitality or some may go into entertainment. But really what any path is after that is, is not so much part of the literature. Mm. Yeah, another group that you mentioned in the book is the musicians, right? So yeah. they, they can play like the shamisen and they can be a part of that world in a kind of, I, I don't know, fringe is, is too much of a, a strong word, but in the kind of, they don't have to make the huge commitment that it takes to become a geiko, but they can still participate in that world. Right, and they're considered so important to the big mm. spring productions and the mm. fall dance mm. productions that are one of the mainstays of Kyoto, especially well, it's canceled again this year, but in the spring mm-hmm. in April, there's the Miyako Odori, you know, this mm-hmm. dance of the capital that goes back to 1872. And mm-hmm. if you don't have enough of the jikata, the musicians, you really can't do it. So some of mm-hmm. the women uh, coming into that profession actually have four-year college degrees and they majored in classical performing arts. So they're quite proficient. Uh, mm-hmm. And when you go to the production, they're 
on the sides of the stage so you can see see them very well as they're doing this fabulous you know musician mm-hmm. musical work and they have quite a range of ages but i think the communities are worried about keeping them employed because at the those evening parties where mm-hmm. you know geisha and michael come to dance not every client wants to spend enough money to have the musician come so providing mm-hmm. steady work for them i think becomes difficult yeah like another another thing that i found interesting was the mention of well of course marriage and kids and then yeah. um you know many it seems that they for example one person you 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 uh talk about in the book she i think it was one person but it, i remember uh saying something like uh she just became happy or she decided to just focus on her art her her kind of career and she was happy with that and she basically gave up on on marriage and children um another person that that you mentioned maybe it was the same person i don't know it was a handful of people but um uh, she she remembers seeing like uh, high schoolers uh, uh, along oh, right. the river and thinking like what she missed out on as a high school student, but then basically concluding that she was happy where she was. Right. So there's this yeah. kind of struggle between the traditional and and the uh, traditional in the marriage sense and traditional in the cultural sense. Right. <laughs> exactly. So we know yeah. like still in Japan, even though. Um, the rate of marriage is decreasing. Yeah. Um, the the age at first marriage is, is rising. Lots of young women and men do not want to get married. However, mm-hmm. for um, women in this geiko role are pretty much expected not to be married. Mm-hmm. I mean, the idea is you're devoted to the arts. And I kind of wonder, too, I didn't read this anywhere, so mm-hmm. that's the caveat, that there's a sense that if you're out every, I mean, if you're involved every evening in mm-hmm. talking with um, these clients that are coming and um, games and fun and so mm-hmm. forth, that this isn't, th- then how could you be the mother who's at home helping her kids with the homework and waiting mm-hmm. patiently mm-hmm. for her husband to come home? Right. You know, in that kind of orthodox, older way of thinking about the family. Mm-hmm. Um, however, in in this world, it's very common for women to be mothers. So they can't Mm -hmm. be wives, but they can be mothers. And while Mm -hmm. there's sometimes a certain stigma in Japan, although not as as much as people might think, Mm -hmm. against single mothers, it's just very common in the geisha world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But then that other point you make about the, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, that was the very funny geisha, Kokimi, who's a a gion Mm -hmm. uh, geiko. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and she's always kind of making fun of herself and her life. And mm-hmm. she's walking along the Kama River and mm-hmm. she sees these couples and she thinks, <laughs> oh, you know, if I could, how much, how fun that would be to dress up in a yukata and be pink and orange. And I'd yeah. be with this boyfriend and, oh, it'd be so romantic. And then she thinks, but I'm a Maiko, so I can't do that. Or I'm a Geiko, I yeah. can't do that. And anyway, I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. So she's always kind of making light of it. But I think... One thing that comes up, or two things really in this literature, that on the one hand, there's so much celebration of the Maiko as a hardworking artist. She can toe Mm -hmm. the line. She can handle the hierarchy. You know, she can do this tough job, which an ordinary Japanese girl couldn't. However, Mm -hmm. then the flip side is, oh, gosh, ordinary Japanese girls must just have the time of their lives. They're in student clubs. They're, Mm -hmm. you know, they have this freedom. They can be anything they want. So there's there's kind of in the literature this binary of what an ordinary Japanese girl is versus a maiko. Right, 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 right. Yeah, another uh, thing that that briefly comes up in the book is the idea that uh, if a woman leaves the profession uh, yeah. quits being a gaiko gets married and then divorced that she is still fine to come back into the world and work again as a gaiko yes that's what i've read in a, in a couple mm-hmm. different books that it that 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 it's fine to go out and come back and mm-hmm. that they had they used to have a kind of ceremony where the woman retiring would um give white rice to mm-hmm her colleagues in in the neighborhood and Mm -hmm. then they said but if you mixed uh some red beans in with it it didn't Mm -hmm. have such a stark kind of i'm cutting off from you but leaves Mm -hmm. the possibility of coming back 
Mm -hmm. And I imagine for women that might have married and divorced, um, needing a way to support themselves would be a good reason to go back to being a geiko Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. she would have a community that knows her and supports her. She knows she has all this training. Uh, She knows what to do and she could make money doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. So... So typically, the 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 job of Egeko is you know you entertain, you might play musical instruments, you dance um, at, at these tea houses, right? Mm-hmm. But um, often, I think, uh, especially in the West, you you get this idea like, oh, they are sex workers or something like uh-huh. that. Could you could you clear this up? Could you give us the the kind of context so that we yeah. understand better? Like, what is there any truth to that? What is the you know history to that? Well, I think it is. That's such a good question, and of mm-hmm. course, I, I hear that a lot. And I think mm-hmm. one of the things that's helpful to think about is that the geisha as a profession or geisha as an identity for a woman goes back to about 1800. So there's mm-hmm. many changes in mm-hmm. the profession and in the woman's status and the women who were geisha over those mm-hmm. many years. And yeah. um, like, for example, in the 30s, there were thousands, I think literally almost 74,000 geisha all over Japan. And yeah. so when you go to very glittering places like the Shinbashi in Tokyo, the very elite geisha, they have one kind of status. But when you're in a very rural, smaller place, as um, mm-hmm. there's a book by Masuda Sayo called Autobiography of a Geisha that was published in 1957. And she talks about uh-huh. being a maiko in Nagano in the 20s and 30s, and that was very mm-hmm. clearly um, involved sexual labor, child mm-hmm. abuse. All, it was a really rough situation. Um, mm. So I think there's a huge range among right. women who were geiko in the past, depending on where they lived and how mm-hmm. elite it was, who their customers were. However, mm-hmm. even let's say if we fast forward to the 1950s, mm-hmm. and there's, I look in the book, uh, at a couple famous movies like uh, Mizoguchi's Gion Bayashi, a geisha in 1953, and a, mm-hmm. a really funny comedy about teenagers called Ken Musume in 1955. And uh-huh. both of them clearly portray Maiko as beautiful dancers who are victims. And they're mm-hmm. victims because they have no control over their future. They will be paired off with a rich, much older man, and they will have no decision over this. And Mm -hmm. this wasn't, in neither of these films, is this a call to social action? It's, I mean, at least as the films portray it, that's kind of the way it is. Um, Although they both want to get out, both the Michael want to get out of the situation. But Mm -hmm. if we, and Michael were still part of the souvenir world of Kyoto at that time. But if we Mm -hmm. fast forward to the 2000s, the movies, the books, the comics are completely different in representing this. The Maiko is absolutely cut off from any kind of sexual labor. Mm-hmm. And she, in fact, because she's seen as almost as if the Okia is a nunnery, you know, she's the chaste mm-hmm. girl devoted to the arts, preserving Japanese traditions, so respectful of her elders. Um, mm-hmm. And this allows her to be the mascot of Kyoto, because we can't imagine in 2000s that Kyoto would want to make this, inter- yeah. you know, make the Maiko an international character brand if she were still involved uh, with sexual labor or a victim, right? right, but, right, right. but the Geiko, on the other hand, um, while she's not a victim and she's not involved in any kind of sexual labor for pay, She's Mm -hmm. still a kind of shadowy figure, I would say, in Mm -hmm. this literature, in all of this representation. And I think it gets to the point of her being an independent woman who's outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. this is, even though there's a lot of career women today who are single women who may have romantic relationships, support Mm -hmm. themselves. So they're not so different now than the geiko in those terms. Mm-hmm. Um, at any rate, I th- so I think that today the emphasis is completely on these women are not victims, they're not engaged in sexual labor, and mm-hmm. the literature emphasizes a real 
break from the mizu shobai, you know, from the mm. entertainment world. Mm. But I think okay. if you look through the history and you look at the different regions in Japan, um, then you would find different statuses, you know, and different. It would mean right. being a geisha would mean different things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like something uh, interesting that that you bring up in the book is basically uh, somebody. I think I think you were quoting somebody that was asking about. Uh, I think it may have been something related to this topic. Uh -huh. And the answer that they got, this was from a person in the oh, yeah. giggle world. They said, like, basically, that's a foolish question because, like, even yeah. if it was the case, we wouldn't say it. And if it wasn't the case, we wouldn't say it. Like, yeah. it's like we wouldn't tell yeah. you anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. And what she was talking yeah. about was the idea of a danna, a patron, uh -huh. oh, who yeah, yeah, was yeah. really also in a romantic relationship with a geiko, uh -huh. not just a financially supportive one. And, yeah. um, and people that, Japanese, that write these guides to uh -huh. these, you know, the geisha world say that even Japanese audiences want to ask this question, are there still patrons? But they're really hesitant. Yeah. And so then they ask, and they're just given this kind of ambiguous answer. Right. Um, so, but in it's real interesting in in the literature of contemporary uh, geiko, they really don't talk about it. I mean, oh, it's just uh -huh. and and it's also emphasized that today. Or I don't know if this is a way they get around it, if it's euphemistic yeah. or or to what extent it's true. But so I'm interested in how they represent it. And um, mm -hmm. they say that, you know, we don't have these wealthy men who are going to be able to support a geiko, which takes a whole lot of money because of all the lessons and mm -hmm. uh, presents she has to give and all, all kinds of things that are the expenses of a geiko. So there's more people that become her patrons. And mm -hmm. they liken it to people who would become patrons of opera or ballet Mm -hmm. uh, or something like that. And right, so right. perhaps I think this um, might be moving more towards this kind of patronage, not a person um, supporting a geiko, but many people supporting the, uh, supporting an artist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like, <laughs> it, I mean, nowadays, right, it, it's we're in a different world. It, it's not the case that, you know, the, a few head of the Zaibatsu, these monopolistic right. companies can support just, uh, you know, a whole bunch of geiko, right? So it seems that the only way to have this be something sustainable is that more people are, you know, providing funds in some way. Exactly, yeah. And that's where they tried to, or they have in Kyoto, set up this, what's nicknamed the Okini Zaidan. It's mm -hmm. the Kyoto Traditional Musical Foundation. And mm -hmm. they get funds from all kinds of uh, Kyoto industry and boards and government and so forth to support um, mm -hmm. the geiko and these mus musicians and so forth because it's such an important part of Kyoto culture. It's also a huge mm -hmm. tourist um, brand, I would think. Yeah. yeah. Um, but this, mo and then you can join the organization as a supporter for mm -hmm. about. I, oh, maybe I shouldn't say because I can't remember exactly, but it's yeah. not terribly expensive. And then you're invited to um, different parties and lectures and you can get introductions so you can go to a tea house. So I think they're trying to move towards that more formal kind of support with mm -hmm. groups. And also of that group, half are women. Mm, that's exactly what I want to ask yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes it more easy for women to become supporters because up until, you know, that kind of thing became more common, it was basically a man gives money. That's how it works, right? Right, right. Whether, you know, whatever his relationship was, it was mainly this right. male. Um, the, the client was always a man. So yeah. what I found so interesting in the literature that's written almost entirely by women, for women, about women and girls, is mm -hmm. that they tend to keep men out of the frame. I mean, they'll talk about clients, but you, know, you never get much sense of these men. And of course, they have 
their privacy is protected, so they never talk sure. about clients. But even in a general sense, they might talk about certain behaviors that they like, you know, men who know the arts that really treat, um, that are interesting to talk to, treat people well. Um, mm -hmm. But they also are very interested in women becoming clients, and they themselves are very good friends with um, Geico and tea house managers who are also women. And so you get the sense if there's, if Ozashki, these tea house parties become more uh, frequented by women clients, and uh, mm -hmm. then it changes the atmosphere and yeah. the whole aura of the Hanamachi. Then Geiko and Maiko aren't kind of seen as playthings for men, but it becomes mm -hmm. a real sort of women's world. And the Maiko mm -hmm. represents almost a kind of sentimental attachment to girlhood. It just changes mm -hmm. things a lot. But in, mm -hmm. in the whole literature, I never heard about a woman becoming a patron, even yeah. in the sense of being a major contributor. It's not to say that they might not exist, but just uh, right, right. They're, it's not in the representations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is me just kind of uh, uh, drawing conclusions sure. from you know what I know and from what I read in the book. But it seems that the big events like the Miyako Dori, these big dance events that happen, you know, once a year, um, those are accessible to everyone. But for a woman to go to a tea house and, and you know, pay for entertainment, um, that is a much higher bar that your average woman, both yeah. for financial reasons and for kind of these social kind of ideas of what a woman is supposed to do, you know, yeah. th they would be far more hesitant to do that rather than to just go to the Miyako Dori and watch the performance. Right. right. Which you could do for like 35 or 40 dollars. But then yeah. you'd go to Ozashki might be $300. So, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just that it, it, it's so expensive for one. And you might mm -hmm. not be able to have any uh, business entertaining budget. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the whole thing of clients gets a little hazy. It's, there's mm -hmm. so much focus on the literature on the arts and kind of polish of Geiko mm -hmm. and Maiko. But... I should say, too, that of all this literature, whether it's movies or comics or novels, it really mm -hmm. focuses on Maiko. And mm -hmm. the Geiko mm -hmm. are just sort of minor characters. And even women who've been Geiko for much longer than they were Maiko, like Iwasaki Mineko, for example, mm -hmm. most of her um, memoir, Geisha Life, and certainly there, there's a great comic about her called Crimson Fragment. Fragrance by the um, mm -hmm. famous manga artist Yamato Waki. And mm -hmm. it's three volumes. And she's a Maiko for all three volumes except the very end. And then uh -huh, she becomes uh -huh. a Geiko. And then she retires. So right. I think, and partly it's maybe this this um, interest in the girl, you know, in Japanese yeah. culture, that she's hardworking and her future's yeah, ahead yeah, of yeah. her and she's free. Yeah. And, the, and then when she becomes a geiko, she's an adult like anybody else and has lots of responsibilities yeah. and, and so forth. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, I mean, shonen or even shoujo manga, right? Where uh, you yeah. know, the character is the 15-year-old kid. He's, yeah. he's fighting hard to become the best in the world or, you know, that kind of idea, I suppose, right? Yeah, yeah, that's so true. I mean, I remember being at one of the dances um, mm. in the spring and there was an audience and there were a lot of older women in front of me. And then Michael came out on stage and they said, oh, Michael-san, oh, kawaii. You know, this is really cute. <laughs> now, of course, I'm behind them going, oh, Michael-san, kawaii too. I think there's something just, they're just so pretty. And there's so many ideas of girlhood that are projected yeah. onto them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you want to cheer them on. And they're kind of like this aspirational sort of figure in a way, whereas the Geico is the teacher, right? She's kind yeah. of the person in the back. Yeah, what a good yeah. point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, very. It's kind of you want to cheer them on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so something really fun in the book um, was the last section, um, and I, I really uh, enjoyed learning about this, but uh, there were these uh, tenugui, which are yeah. these kind of hand towels with these like really interesting depictions of, of, of Michael. Could you explain what that was and, and get, give a little context for that? Yeah, isn't that great? I'm, like, I'm glad you yeah. like that. I love that part. <laughs> I love that section. <laughs> yeah, as you're walking around Kyoto, especially in some of the tourist mm. areas, you come across this store called Eirakuya, and it's been uh -huh. a textile 
a firm for 400 years. And anyway, yeah. going inside, you find all these cotton hand towels. And cotton hand towels, the tenugui, have this really mm-hmm. long history in Japan, and they're used for all kinds of very practical things. But yeah. they're also a tool of performing artists, so kabuki actors, geisha, rakugo. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, comedians yeah. might use this in their um, performances. And then mm-hmm. in the Edo period, tenugui were took on greater designs and so forth. But Mm -hmm. um, anyway, when you go into Eirakia, they have all kinds of tenugui framed and up on their walls. And Mm -hmm. many of the ones of Michael are quite romantic, showing them at famous places in Kyoto, like the Fushimi Inari Shrine. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's also these very funny ones. And I always wondered what's going on with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Michael in full costume, you know, coming up to bat in a baseball game yeah. or riding a horse <laughs> or skiing down mountains. And so I just had to find out about this. And these were made in the 1930s when there was quite an interest in women and sports. And mm-hmm. then it was revived in the 2000s by the most recent head of the firm. And he's the one that came up with these designs of uh, girls playing soccer and golf mm-hmm. and uh, at the beach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that sounded uh, like that. That's the kind of thing that I might buy for someone. Yeah, you know what's so interesting? I always wanted to buy those. Oh, and they yeah. also now have ones that are designed with a Halloween theme and a Christmas oh, theme really? too. But they said that um, Japanese uh, who travel to Kyoto yeah. tend to buy the funny ones. But international mm-hmm. tourists tend to buy the more romantic ones, the more classic. Yeah, you. yeah I get why that would happen. Yeah. 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 You, you know, when you want to bring something, quote unquote, oh. typical Japanese, right? Back yeah. for your friend in the U.S. or whatever. But the Japanese person, they know typical Japanese. They want something, you know, fun, something a little bit different, right? Yeah. 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 And, and oh, you know, what's was really funny. Was, yeah. I was I've always loved this one of hit a Homer Maiko with the two Maiko uh-huh. up to bat. And then yeah. I saw that the Hanshin Tigers really do have a Maiko throw out the first pitch now. Oh, and she, I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's so funny. She wears a kimono that looks like the same material as a Hanshin Tigers uniform. And uh-huh, she's uh-huh. up at the play or no what do you call it well the pitcher's man that's it and she threw up and she has her formal hair and all this and Uh wow she really could get that ball across the plate (laughs) and i thought oh my gosh for years i've been laughing at this it's just an absurd comic and it went oh well (laughs) (laughs) and then what one other thing in in that last section also Mm -hmm. that you mentioned which was also really fun was the there's the kyoto international manga museum um has this really fun display of like i think it's a hundred depictions of maiko done by different famous manga artists right right? yeah have you seen Um, it uh, i you know what i've I've been to Kyoto so, so many times and uh-huh. I've just never made my way to the museum ah, uh, just for uh-huh. whatever reason. I sure, I'm sure I will eventually. But yeah. 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 Um, any, any favorites there? <laughs> yeah. You know, that manga, the manga museum is cool. It's in an old primary school that goes back yeah, to 1869. Uh-huh. It has these dark wooden floors. It's a very cozy mm-hmm. atmosphere. And then there's these, there's actually, even though they call it 100 micro illustrations, I think there's like mm-hmm. 174, each done by mm-hmm. a different artist in the Japan Cartoonist Association. And there's mm-hmm. such a range. You get like an Anpan Man micro, mm-hmm. and then you get yeah. real cute little kitten micros, and you get Michael Jackson, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, which is Michael Jackson morphed as a micro. But yeah, one yeah. of my favorites was this old woman who's, like doing Michael cosplay. And she's uh-huh. in the manga by Kuruma Dankichi. And it uh-huh. turns out that she's actually a, a character in his comics. She's kind of the sly granny character, always knows oh. what she wants and uh-huh. often uh-huh. stoops to trickery to get it. But uh-huh. she just looks like she's having the ball. You know, she's all ornamented in the in Kanzashi and she has the sandals and the big uh-huh. obi and this little purse. And, um, uh, but what a friend who was with me pointed out is the way she's holding her handbag and the way she's moving is exactly the same pose of the Sasai San Comics salaryman mm-hmm. figure when he was coming home from the sushi bar, 
you know, kind of uh-huh. too late at night, and he spent too much money, so he brings home a small box of sushi to appease <laughs> his family. So when you know that, and then you see this old woman, you go, oh, she's like breaking the rules. She's having fun as a girl, but breaking the rules like a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, um, oh, but I have a funny story. She's yeah, yeah. She's, the only reason I could tell she was a woman was this little ponytail at the end and I I really thought she was a man so I had done this whole um, analysis of this comic as oh is this interesting about cross-dressing and this goes to the idea of gender what um, a critic Takahata Eddie calls girl consciousness where we don't have to literally be girls to Mm -hmm. adopt a kind of girl consciousness. Oh, perfect example. And then I wrote to Kurima Donkichi and he said, ah, well, actually, it's a woman. It's not a man. (laughs) But And then he was so nice. He said, but if it works better for your research to make him a man, (laughs) go ahead. (laughs) So Japanese. I thought that was funny. (laughs) Wasn't that funny? And then another one I like is high school graduate, Maiko. Uh And Uh what she is is she's rolled up her kimono and bared her legs, and she has this mm-hmm. kind of pink footwear that appears to mm-hmm. mesh with Michael sandals, or mm-hmm. mesh the Michael sandals with platform shoes. And yeah. on her obi, she has this little green and yellow sign that new drivers in Japan have to display on their cars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So she's kind of a de- de- beginning driver in this life. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, and she has lots of makeup on, and just the idea mm-hmm. that that Michael would be walking around with this hiked up skirt and all is very funny. <laughs> but then when you think of the Kogals, uh, the yeah. Kogaru of the late 1990s, and how right. they angered their school officials, you know, by hiking up the skirts of their uniform and bleaching their hair and tanning their skin, and then their look and their yeah. slang and their materialism right. was just causing this big panic. And mm-hmm. the, the Kogals were kind of read as a masquerade of delinquency, maybe even non japanese mm-hmm. But then in contrast, the Maiko, I mean, for her, Japanese tradition is her fashion. And mm-hmm. she's dressed yeah. to code by her elders. So I think that manga is so interesting because it kind of crosses teen virtue with teen delinquency. Yeah. And it contrasts Maiko containment in tradition with this kind of out-of-bounds teen behavior. I think it's just, it's just one that sort of makes you stop and think. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there are so many fun depictions there. I mean, I, I think I I would go to the museum just to check them out. So. <laughs> yeah, they're really fun. And they're all, you can walk the halls and see them all. It's very um, easy to access. I really wish they had a catalog of all of these uh-huh. of the 100 micro illustrations. Yeah. Because they're just yeah. wonderful and they're so different. You have Martian Maiko and Picasso Maiko and uh, uh-huh. all kinds. I thought when one was really funny, I thought, oh, yeah. this cartoonist didn't like Maiko much. Maybe he doesn't like the assignment because it was such a pig-faced Maiko. I thought, what's uh-huh. going on with that? Well, then it turns out, I think his name's Chiba Tetsuro. Tets- oh, uh-huh. I forgot. And it's a sumo, it's a sumo manga character. And oh, so he's okay. put his own character in Maiko where. Uh, and so, okay, okay, okay. you know, there's no explanation on the on the walls about any of the manga. you It's yeah, just yeah, what yeah. you see. So if you go through the museum with people who kind of are aware of the backstory or like mm-hmm. um, one friend I went with knew all kinds of Japanese popular culture things and even American movies, I didn't know. And she pointed it out and went, oh, now I get it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. these were the whole manga exhibit was launched in 2006. So it'd be mm-hmm. interesting to see if years and years later, if they still have it up, if people could mm-hmm. read them, because they they mm-hmm. might not know the context then. Yeah, you know, like get a lot these backstories. Yeah, get lost. Yeah. Huh. Um, l- last question, but uh, for anybody that wants to experience a little bit more of this world would you say like one of the best places to go to is is one of these uh big dance events like the yeah Miyako-dori? yeah because there you see the maiko and geiko doing things that they feel most proud of and while they mm-hmm. were canceled this spring because of covid mm-hmm. um i hope that they mm-hmm. will be produced again next fall and yeah. they work very hard at this and they really consider this um a prime performance much more than the dancing they do in the small venues of the tea houses 
you know. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. one one question, if I can go back to that you had yeah. mentioned to me earlier, was could a foreigner be a Maiko? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that one. That oh, is, yeah. yeah, no, please. I want to I want to get your insight on that yeah. because you mentioned you bring that up in the conclusion of the book, and I thought it was such a poignant question that I really wanted to, it really got me thinking and I loved what you put in the book. So please, please explain. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a good question you asked because they're, you know, they do get requests from foreigners and Mm -hmm. there is at this point, no room, no, you know, it's really limited to ethnically Japanese Mm -hmm. girls. So Mm -hmm. in that way, this idea of the ordinary girl kind of problematizes what it means to be a girl in Japan and it, mm. who's a Japanese citizen. What if you're a Japanese girl who's not, who, well, let's say who's has um, one parent from a different yeah, race or culture. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and there's more and more people like that. Yeah, so, yeah. What if you're an immigrant to Japan, you've uh-huh. been yeah. written, you're fluent in Japanese and you want to become a Maiko. Um, yeah. You know, at, at this point, there's really no way to do that. Um, And so one of the things I I thought about what maybe this teaches us about Japanese society, by looking at this ordinary girl who comes from many places in Japan, but the most important Mm -hmm. thing is she becomes a maiko, is we learn that Japanese identity might be as much a masquerade as the maiko's costume. I mean, it's something Mm -hmm. they have to learn to wear. In other Mm -hmm. words... These ordinary girls, as they're described, who come to Kyoto to be mm-hmm. trained in Michael language, arts, and etiquettes, are in the end imagined as becoming more Japanese in the process. So yeah. their transformations, what I call this Michael masquerade, because they already are Japanese by passport. But this yeah. also suggests that Japaneseness requires work and that mm-hmm. Japanese girls are in danger of losing a sense of Japanese identity. At the same time, the literature tends to represent all these girls as ethnically Japanese. Yep. You know, so on the one hand, they're Japanese, but they're not quite as Japanese as they should be. It's not as properly Japanese. They've lost a lot of what it means to be Japanese. But in all this discussion, there seems to be no place in this particular Japanese community for girls who are biracial, for example, or foreign or immigrants. So the, in this way, we get into the larger prob- uh, problem in Japan of ethno-nationalism, which mm-hmm. also comes out in this literature, which is intended to Japanese for Japanese, and and not that ethno nationalism isn't you know a problem in many parts of the world, of sure, course, sure. including the U.S. But mm-hmm. um, I think what the writers are doing is they're trying to kind of renovate the reputation of the geisha world in Japan for Japanese, that it's not the place of sex work and so forth that they've heard, and corruption that they've heard before. Rather, Mm -hmm. it's like another national arts community that they should take pride in as as Japanese. And Mm -hmm. I think in that they're not really intending to be ethno-national as much as they're trying to give it a new perspective and say yeah. if if many countries have these arts that we celebrate because they're part of a national t- tradition, couldn't this be one too? Mm-hmm. And yet, mm-hmm. by the fact that that's real living people and seems limited to girls that are ethnically Japanese, then that becomes a mm-hmm. problem. And also, I guess it, I, we could say too that there are only girls who did this role Mm-hmm. And um, and there have been changes in other parts of, of Japanese society. For example, one of the things I studied is beauty queens. And yeah. local beauty contests now tend to, uh, if they're supported by a local government, if you're going to be like a Miss Fujisawa, you know, near Tokyo, mm-hmm. now they'll have a Miss and a Mr. So mm-hmm. because there mm-hmm. is part of the government, a lot of times there's, you can't, there's, there trying to make it more gender equal. So it might be kind of a retro form, but there's mm-hmm. this idea that um, uh, it isn't limited to just girls. And yet right, in right. all the Maiko literature, the only boy who becomes a Maiko <laughs> is a complete fiction, you know, is this yeah. light fiction series called Chiyogiku, which is a really yeah. fun series. Yeah, But yeah, that yeah, too yeah, kind of fun. questions... Um, gender itself as a masquerade, not just Japanese-ness, but if a boy can so easily learn all the ways to become a maiko, you know, the language mm-hmm. behavior, the girlishness, um, what does that say about gender itself as a kind mm-hmm. of um, 
masquerade that you can, that at least for this boy, he goes easily back and forth between being a boy and being a girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, for example, one person that I thought of um, when I was thinking about this topic was yeah. um, I have cousins that are uh, half Japanese, uh-huh. half Peruvian. Oh. And they, they live in, well, most of them live in Tokyo and they have children that were either spent pretty much all their lives in Japan or were actually born and raised in in Japan. So, for example, uh, these are, Mm. technically speaking, quarter Japanese Uh children, but they basically grew up in Japan speaking Japanese. They Mm -hmm. went to Japanese school. They are as Japanese as anybody else. Yeah. Could one of their daughters become a Geiko or or a Maiko, right? And and that's just something that I I couldn't help think about. Yeah, me too. And I think if... You know, you, you, as I, mean, I like to think in in the twenty first century, they'll mm-hmm. open that that it would yeah. become more acceptable. Uh, you know, that mm-hmm. that you would have a broader idea of what it means to be Japanese. I guess that's yeah. the key thing. Yeah, just like yeah. we need I mean, in the U.S. You know, a, yes, a, a yes, yes. broader idea of what it means to be American. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there does seem to be a raising awareness of that. It's it's slow, and and I think many people would say it's not fast enough. But uh-huh. there there's change. There's change. Yeah. <laughs> if you, you look hard look enough, for you the can find it. signs. You know. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah. who knows? You know, with the challenges of because I think the um, the geisha world was so hurt by COVID because you couldn't uh-huh. have parties, yeah. you couldn't have dances, and so forth. Yeah, I can only um, imagine. Yeah. So how it comes back and how it has to adapt will be. Yeah. Um, a challenge. Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, there there is plenty more to the book. There's a lot of history there too in, in the first part of the book too that we didn't really get to cover, but that's for people to uh, read the book. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Tony. It's so fun no, no. talking you. with you. You're one of the first readers of the book. I, I really? Saw. Oh thank you so well, much. I, it's, it was so What I do great. is I like to... I like to look on Amazon to see what's coming out new. Oh. And I saw your book. It's like, hmm, I haven't talked about Michael. This seems interesting. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> well, thanks so much. And your questions, you know, just it, because I've been so immersed in it and to have new yeah. questions and what, oh, what you, strikes you as interesting is just so fascinating for me. So <laughs> I really appreciate thank you, thank you. it. Of course, there will be an Amazon affiliate link in the show notes if you just want to go straight to the listing for the book. Um, That will be in the show notes, right? So you can find that in your podcast app or at japanstationpodcast.com. I did clip out one short section. Um, It was a few minutes. I think it was about five minutes uh, from the conversation. Not that it wasn't interesting. I just wanted to keep the conversation nice and tight. And so I'm including that as a bonus for the patrons over at japankyo.com slash Patreon. So if you're interested in checking that out, Go sign up for the uh, Patreon. That one, uh, you only have to sign up for the $1 a month uh, tier and you will get access to that. $3 a month and above and you get access to that other podcast that I do, Japanese Plus Alpha. It's about the Japanese language. Uh, But anyway, yeah, if you want to go check out uh, what we talked about, um, let's just say it involved Hawaii, pancakes, and Michael on the beach. So... (laughs) Uh, but uh, yeah, we went off on a little tangent there. Uh, but again, japanka.com slash Patreon for that. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. Remember to subscribe, rate, review, and tell a friend. Follow on Facebook and Twitter at Japankyo News. And thank you so much to Yunomi for allowing me to use Oedo Controller as the opening and closing song for this show. That does it for this episode. Uh, The next one should be coming out on May 15th. I've got a couple different ones in the works, so I'm not going to say what the topic will be, but uh, whatever it is, should be out on May 15th. And if you haven't checked out Ichimon Japan, well, go do that. That is the other podcast that I do about Japan. Um, That one is with my uh, old grad school buddy from here in Hawaii. Uh, We both graduated with uh, master's degrees in Japanese language and linguistics, and we like to talk about Japanese language things. So um, the latest episode is about the Kansai dialect, Kansai Ben. So if you want to hear um, one of the worst Star Wars Kansai dialect puns that probably exists, maybe it's the only one that exists. <laughs> My original Kansai dialect Star Wars pun, go 
check that episode out. That is Ichimon Japan episode 42. All right. So japanq.com slash Ichimon Japan or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it!